Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Hello, grade 9. Hope you're doing well. This is Ms. May Muhammad al Khayyam. Today, inshallah, we're going to revise on some important concepts and tips from the first term just to make you ready for the exam. Let's go. Now, we started with unit one, lesson one, motion in one direction. And we have to know what is motion and when can we say that anybody is moving or in motion. So motion, it is the change of an object position as time passes according to the position or location of another fixed object or this is a fixed point. Pay attention, I can remove according to or replace it with uh, relative to the position of another fixed object. Don't forget, this is the motion and don't be confused with it and the relative speed as we're going to introduce after a while. So according to this yeah, moving car, it changed its position from the building towards the tree. Therefore, this car was in motion. Okay, now how can we describe and compare the motion of objects? We can say that some objects are faster than others. So we have to come to the scientific term here, or this physical term, which is the speed. Okay, let's see. Huh, this car, the red one or the blue one will be faster. Let's see it. It's obvious here that the red car is faster than the blue one. Why? Because it covered 100 meters in five seconds, while the blue one covered 50 meters in five seconds. It means also that this red one covered longer distance in the same time. But in this case here, okay, the blue car is faster than the red one. Why? Because this blue car covered 100 meters in five seconds, while the red car took 10 seconds to cover yeah, the same distance, which means that the blue one covered the same distance in less time. Okay, here we come with the definition of a speed, which is, it is a distance moved through a unit time or the rate of a change of distance. Okay, according to this, if I'm going to ask you, what are the two factors necessary to describe the motion or the movement of object here it is the distance and time. Therefore, the relation, which is the speed V equals distance over time. Here we come to this relation. If I'd like to calculate the distance, it is the speed multiplied by the time. If I'd like to calculate the time, it is distance over speed. Don't forget the measuring unit of this, the speed, which is ha, huh, it is kilometer per hour or meter per second. What if I'd like to change from kilometer per hour to meter per second? Therefore, I have to yeah, multiply, we all, we all know that, to change from kilometer uh, here, from kilometer to meter, multiply by 1,000. While to change from hour to seconds, and don't forget that it is in the denominator, it is multiplied by 60 by 60. If you're going to calculate this, you're going to have, yeah, this factor, which is 5 over 18. But what if I'd like to change from meter per second to kilometer per hour? Divide by the same factor, which is 5 over 18. Okay, now we came with the types of speed. We all know that we have two types of speed that are huh, the uniform or regular speed and the yeah, irregular or non-uniform speed. Okay, let's start with regular or uniform speed. What does it mean? Here, this car A, it covers equal distances, the 100 meters, in equal periods of time, 10 seconds each. If you're going to calculate the speed in each interval, speed equal distance over time is 100 over 10. It is 10 meter per second. While, ha, huh, so this is the definition of regular speed, which is, it is the speed by which the object moves when it covers equal distances in equal periods of time. Pay attention here, the regular or uniform speed that the value of the speed is constant. Each interval, it is 10 meter per second. While the irregular speed, let's see this here. Yeah, this car B, it moves to cover, yeah, unequal distances, 100, 120, 80, in equal periods of time. Therefore, this is the definition for irregular speed, which is, it is the speed by which the object moves when it covers, yeah, unequal distances at equal periods of time, or it is the speed by which the object moves when it covers equal distances at unequal periods of time. Now, what is average speed? Practically, the moving object cannot move with regular speed all over the trip. Why? Due to the yeah, road and traffic conditions. Therefore, we are using the irregular speed instead. Uh, to calculate the irregular speed practically or precisely, we need to, yes, use the average speed, which is 
total distance covered by the moving object divided by the total time taken to cover this object. It is d1 plus d2 plus d3 and so on over time 1 plus time 2 plus time 3. Okay, I have another uh, definition for the average speed, which may be confusing for some of you, which is it represents the, yeah, the regular speed by which the object moves to cover the same distance at the same period of time. Let's explain this now. To apply the uh, rule of the average speed in this case, for example, here, V average, don't forget that this is the simple for V average equals D1 plus D2 plus D3, okay? D1 plus D2 plus D3 over T1 plus T2 plus T3. Therefore, here it is 100 plus 100 plus 100, it is 300 over 10 plus 10 plus 10 over 30. This is equal to 10 meter per second. Just from while we calculated the regular speed at each interval, which is 10 meter per second also. So this explains this definition. The average speed represents the regular speed when the body is moving with uniform or regular speed. Here we come with the relative speed. What is relative speed? Relative speed means that I have an observer. According to the position and the direction of this observer, the relative speed differs. If the observer is at rest, what is the meaning of this? Is the observer static? First of all, what is the meaning of relative speed? It is the speed of a moving object relative to ha, a static or a moving observer. What does the meaning of static? Ha, body at rest or an observer which is at rest. Not body at rest, uh, the observer, he's at rest. Okay, like this traffic man. If you're going to ha, move in front of this traffic man carrying the radar, for example, so the radar will give you the exact or the, yeah, the real speed of your car. So the observer here is at rest, the relative speed equals to the actual, the real speed. But what if the yeah, observer is moving in the same direction with different speed, like these two cars? This blue one is moving with 100 km per hour, while this one is moving with 60 km per hour. This observer here on this car, yeah, therefore the relative speed according to observer in this car is equal to, yeah, same subtract, same subtract. Same subtract to get what? To get the relative speed. Therefore, the relative speed equals the real speed minus the observer speed. But what if I have the relative speed and the observer speed, but I need to calculate the real speed? Therefore, the real speed equals the relative speed plus the observer speed. Also, here I have another condition, which is when the two cars are moving in the same direction with the same speed. Therefore, yeah, the relative speed equals to zero. Why? Applying this concept, relative equals real minus observer, 100 minus 100 gives you the zero. Now, the observer is moving in the opposite direction of the moving object. Opposite direction means to add huh, the real speed plus the observer speed to get the relative speed. But to calculate the real speed, if the relative speed and the observer speed are given, therefore the real, the real speed or the actual speed equals the relative speed Yep, plus the observer's, uh, minus the observer's speed. Now, unit one, lesson two, graphic representation of moving in a straight line. Okay, why do physics use graphs and tables? Just to make it easier to predict the relation between some physical quantities. Here I have a relation between distance, time, and after calculating it, I have the speed. Okay, so after five seconds, the distance covered is 0.4 meters and so on. If you're going to calculate the speed in each time, it will be 0.08. Did you notice something? Yes, here the speed values are constant, which means that this is regular speed or uniform speed. Therefore, we can just uh, see the relation here between distance and time. Okay. So to represent the regular speed or the uniform speed by a distance time graph, it is a straight line passing through the origin. How can we draw it? Just go to five seconds and go up to 0.4 meters, just plot it and put a point and complete by huh, connecting them together, this straight line passing through the origin. Why? Because the distance and time are what they are inversely related or directly related. Yes, there is a direct relation between distance and time when the speed is constant or the slope of the graph distance over time is constant, which means that the body is moving to cover equal distances in equal periods of time. 
if I'd like to represent this uh, regular speed or uniform speed by speed time graph, therefore, the time is on the yeah, x-axis, y speed is on the y-axis. It is a straight line parallel to the time axis. Why? Because as time passes, the speed is constant. Here, the relation distance time graph for an object moves at a non-uniform speed is represented by ha, a curved line passing by the origin point. Here we come to yeah, another term or another concept. Did you hear before about speeding up or slowing down? Yes, for sure. When we increase or decrease the, ha, the speed of the moving object. Therefore, yeah, we have to know that the, to describe the change in the car speed in one second, in this case, we use the physical quantity, which is called acceleration. What is acceleration? It is the change of an object speed in one second in a specific direction, or it is the rate of a change of speed. Put this in your mind. If there is no change in speed, no acceleration. What is the meaning of no change in speed? No change in speed means that the speed value is constant, which is regular or uniform speed. So if the body is moving with regular or uniform speed, this means that acceleration equals to zero. Why? Because there is no change in speed. Let's go now with how can we calculate acceleration? Acceleration A equals delta V over delta T. What is delta in physics? It is change. Therefore, the acceleration, it is the change in speed over uh, the time. What is delta V? It is final speed. V2 minus initial speed V1 over the time. Now, to calculate V1 according to this relation, it is V2 minus acceleration multiplied by the time, while V2 is V1 plus acceleration multiplied by the time. Some important notes. Okay, what is the acceleration unit? It is the speed over time. Okay, so according to the unit of speed, maybe meter per second square or kilometer per hour square. Now, another some important notes, yeah, just to help you to uh, uh, just practice and yeah, uh, uh, just solve some problems here. If the body is moving at regular speed, so its acceleration equals to zero. Why so? Because its speed doesn't change as time passes. When delta V equals zero, then acceleration equals to zero. Like if the regular speed is 60, this means the initial speed equals to the final speed, 60 minus 60 equals to zero. If the body starts moving from rest, so its initial speed equals to zero. While when the body stops moving, this means that the final speed equals to zero. And also when the car is moving, when the, the uh, uh, he used the brakes, is of the, he applied the brakes uh, to stop the car after a period of time, so its final speed equals to zero also. Now, here we come with the uniform acceleration. What does mean the meaning of uniform acceleration? Uniform acceleration, it is the acceleration by which an object moves in a straight line when the speed changes by equal values through equal periods of time. So this change in the speed is constant, not the speed itself. The speed is increasing or decreasing. Let's apply this concept. If a body is moving with 10 meter per second, then 20 meter per second, then 30 meter per second, and then 40 meter per second, so you can say that we are changing the speed, but the value of the change is constant. From 10 to 20, uh, we added 10. From 20 to 30, we added another 10, and so on. So this change in the speed, uh, the increase, or later on the decrease, is the constant value. Here I have the positive acceleration or the negative acceleration. Positive acceleration it is the acceleration by which an object moves in a straight line when its speed increases by equal values through equal periods of time. Therefore, negative acceleration it is the opposite. Uh, it is an acceleration by which an object moves in a straight line when its speed decreases by equal values through equal periods of time. Now, the positive acceleration, don't forget when we uh, are presented by a speed time graph, it is a straight line passing through the origin and uh, it is an accelerating motion where the initial speed is less than the final speed. While to represent negative acceleration, it is a straight line decreasing like this speed time graph. And don't forget also that here, the initial speed is bigger than the final speed. Now to some simple graphic relations, a body at rest. What is the meaning of a body at rest? A body that doesn't change its position as time passes. Therefore, as time passes, the distance is constant. It is a straight line parallel to the time axis. To represent this uh, body at rest or zero speed, it can be represented by speed time graph. Some of you are going to forget this part, which is 
ha, ya, it is a straight line on the horizontal axis. So if you saw yeah, an empty graph speed time, this represents a body at rest. A body moves at regular speed. A body moves at regular speed, ha, if it is distance time graph, so it is a straight line passing through the origin point, or a speed time graph, a straight line part to the time axis. But here, a body moves at an irregular speed or accelerating motion. This is a distance time graph, a curved line passing through the origin. If it is increasing or decreasing, positive acceleration or decelerating motion, negative acceleration. So the positive acceleration, as we just mentioned, speed time graph, straight line passing through the origin, or the negative acceleration is just a straight line going down. This is an important graph here, which represents the uniform acceleration, which is acceleration in time. As time passes, the acceleration is constant. This means it is uniform acceleration. With some complex graphic relations, just we're going to explain this part. A body here, it is distance time graph, okay? And a straight line passing through the origin. So it rep represents uh, a body moves with regular speed. Regular speed means zero acceleration. But after a time, uh, it is straight line part of the time axis. So the body came to rest. Here, for example, speed time graph, it is regular speed, which means zero acceleration. While uh, in this part, yeah, a positive acceleration. Now, unit one, lesson three, the scalar and vector quantities. Some physical quantities are classified to scalars or vectors. According to what? Let's see it. Uh, the scalar physical quantity, to describe a scalar physical quantity, it's enough to know its magnitude only, the numeric value and measuring unit. Like what? If I told you that I covered, yeah, I covered a distance of 10. 10 what? 10 meters or kilometers. The 10 is the numeric value, and the meters or kilometer is the measuring unit. So here, this is what is meant by magnitude, the what numeric value and measuring unit. From the examples of scalar physical quantities, the mass, its measuring unit is kilogram, and the time, its measuring unit is second or hour, and also the length or distance, its measuring unit is meter, and the speed, which is measuring unit, is meter per second or kilometer per hour, and also don't forget radius, area, density, or the examples of other examples of some scalar physical quantities. But what about the vector physical quantities? To describe a vector physical quantity, it's not to know its magnitude and direction. Like what? Like the, yeah, force. The force you apply to push something in front of you. Here, I mentioned what a direction. So force, which is measuring unit, is Newton. And also the velocity, it's measuring units meter per second, kilometer per hour. Hmm, did you notice something? That it has the same measuring unit of speed. Yeah, we say that speed and velocity are two faces where this force the same coin, but one is a scalar and the other is vector. Also here I have the displacement. Its measuring unit is meter, the same measuring unit as distance. Also the, yeah, the acceleration, its measuring unit is meter per second square or kilometer per hour square. Why so? Because we have an increase or decrease in the acceleration as positive or negative acceleration. Now let's go with yeah, distance and displacement. At the first glance, you may think that both of them are the same. But as we mentioned, one of them is scalar, the other is yeah, vector. Let's see this car. It moved from A to B taking this pathway, this curved pathway. Therefore here, the distance is it is the actual path or the actual length of the path that a moving object covers from the starting point to the ending point. Why the displacement is, it is the distance covered at a certain direction from the primary position of the movement towards its final position. Here we mentioned a direction from A to B or eastward direction. But what if I'd like to calculate the amount of displacement? When I say the amount of displacement, your eyes on the shortest straight line between what? Between the starting position and the final position. Therefore, here I have some notes. When can the displacement happen equal the distance covered? This happens only when, yeah, the object moves in a straight line in one direction from A to B and stop at B. But the amount of displacement happened is less than the distance covered Yes, like this case, this happens when, yeah, the object or the body moves in a curved path or any pathway that doesn't represent a straight line. Here, the distance is bigger than or more than the displacement. 
the displacement of a moving object equals to zero. Uh, this is very important. This happens when yeah, the uh, body or the object returns to its primary or starting position of movement, where the final position of movement is the same of the primary position. Therefore, if you heard that the body moved to cover this distance and return back to the same starting position without thinking displacement equals to zero. Now, the displacement of two different objects are equal when they have the same magnitude and move in the same direction. Like what? Let's explain this. If you are moving in a eastward direction, like you're moving five meters to east and your friend is moving five meters also, but to west, do you have the same displacement? No, because you have different directions, although that you have uh, or covered the same amount or the same distance. Okay, here, if the body is moving in a straight line from A to B, so the distance equal to the displacement. Don't forget, displacement simple is D with an R over it. While if you're going to move from A to B to and you turn back to C, therefore the distance is AB plus BC, and the displacement is the shortest straight line between the starting position A and the ending position C, so it is AC. Now, if you're going to move in two perpendicular straight lines, so the distance is AB plus BC, while the displacement is AC in AC direction or southern uh, east. Here, from A to B to C to D, and you stop at D, therefore the distance is AB plus BC plus CD, while the displacement is AD in AD direction. If you're going to move from A to B and return back to A or return back to the same starting position, therefore the displacement equals to zero, while the distance will differ, you have to add the whole distance covered. If you're going to move in a circular path, from A to B to C and return back to A. Here, a complete circle means that the displacement equals to zero, while the distance is circumference of the circle, two by R. Okay, what if you're going to move to cover a three quarters of a circle? For sure, your distance covered will not be the whole circumference. It is three quarters of the two by R, while the displacement will be, yes, AD, which is calculated from Pythagoras theory square root of AM square plus MD square, where AM represent the radius of this circle. If we're going to move in half a circle, therefore the distance is half the circumference, half multiplied two by R, while the displacement is AC, which represents the diameter of this circle, or R plus R, two R. While if you're going to move in quarter a circle, therefore, yeah, the Distance is quarter multiplied by two by R, while the displacement is AB, which is calculated also by Pythagoras theory. Average speed and average velocity. Here we come to, it's the total distance covered by the object in one second and a unit time, while the average velocity is the displacement covered by the object in one second, or is the rate of change of displacement. Just pay attention that we used a vector quantity to describe the velocity, and we used a scalar quantity which is distance to describe the speed. Therefore, the velocity, it is the speed in a given direction when the body moves in a straight line in one direction. Now, here we come with the wind direction. Okay, what happens when the plane takes off? In the same direction of wind from 31 to 32. This is with the wind direction. Put in your mind here uh, something to remind you, like if you're going to swim with the waves or against the waves. If you're going to swim with the waves, so it is easier for you to swim. Why? Because you are not going to face the resistance of the water. Here, it is the same, but the resistance of the wind. Therefore, the value of its velocity increases, so the time of the trip decreases, and therefore, the amount of fuel consumed decreases. Well, if you're going to move against the, or swim against the waves, here we come to, if the plane takes off in the opposite direction of wind from 32 to 31. This is again is the wind. Therefore, the plane will yeah, face the resistance of the wind. So the value of the velocity decreases and the time taken will for this trip increases and the amount of fuel consumed increases. Give reason, pilots take in consideration the velocity of wind. This is because that the direction of wind affects the, uh, the velocity of the plane and hence the time of the trip and the amount of the fuel consumed. Okay, let's go to practice with some questions. Choose the correct answer. The distance covered through a unit time represents the, yeah, it represents the speed. In the opposite graph, it represents two bodies, 
Okay, therefore, it is a relation between distance and time graph, and we have body A and body B. Huh. Body A is faster than body B, the two bodies are at rest, or the two bodies have the same speed, or the body B is faster than body A. Actually, here, we have to know that. Yes, let's see. Both of them covered the same distance, but one of them, which is B, covered this distance in less time, while huh, A took the same distance in huh, longer time. This means that the body B is faster than body A. If the speed of car is 72 km per hour, this means that its speed equals 2 meter per second. To change from km per hour to meter per second, we have to multiply by 5 over 18. Let's do it with each other. Yes, calculate it now. You will get, yeah, 20 meter per second. The two factors which can be used to describe the motion of a body are the, yeah, distance and time. The relative speed of a moving object relative to an observer moves at the same speed in the opposite direction, opposite direction, and same speed, yeah, 70 plus 70, you have to add to get the relative speed. So the relative speed is double. The graph which represents the car movement when the driver pre uh, presses the brake, it is, yeah, decreasing. Therefore, this is the graph that shows the uh, decreasing in the speed. When a moving object takes double the time to cover half the distance, so it is, let's explain this. We all know that speed equals distance over time. And uh, here, double the time and half the distance. Half the distance means d over two. And divided by the time, while here the time is doubled also, uh, therefore it is distance, distance over two multiplied by two t equals distance over four t. Here, the time increased by four times. What is the relation between the speed and time? There is an inverse relation between the speed and time, which means if the time increases, the speed uh, decreases by the same amount. Okay, let's see here. Therefore, the speed decreases to quarter. When a car moves by positive acceler uniform acceleration of 10 meter per second squared, this means that positive means that it's increasing. Uniform acceleration. Again, the word uniform is the same as constant, is the same as what the same value. Therefore, acceleration value is the same. But what is it changing here? The speed. Therefore, the car speed increases by the rate of 10 meter per second every second. For the underlying words, a moved car by speed of V to cover a distance between two cities in a time T, then it returned at the same road between the two cities, which means that it covered the same distance back at time 2t, but it took double the time. Here, the time increased to double. What will happen to the speed? For sure, it decreases to half. The relative speed of a moving car relative to an observer at rest, at rest, the static observer, therefore, the relative speed is equal to the real speed. When the object covers the double of distance at the same time, so its speed, yeah, double the distance. What is the relation between the speed and distance? Direct relation. So double distance means, yeah, double the time or double the uh, time if the speed is constant or the speed is doubled if the, yeah, time is constant. Therefore, here, the speed increases to double. Write the scientific term for each of the following statements. The body that's position doesn't change as time passes. Mm, body at rest or constant body. Now let's go with problems. A car, its relative speed is 80 km per hour, calculates its actual speed in the following cases. When the observer is at rest. We all know that if the observer is at rest, okay, so the relative speed equals the actual, the real speed, therefore it is equal to 80 yep, km per hour. When the observer moves in the same direction with speed 30 km per hour. Here, the relative speed, okay, relative speed, equals real speed, yeah, let's go here, real speed minus the uh, minus observer speed. Okay, I have the relative speed, which is 80. I have the observer speed, which is 30. How to calculate the real speed? Real speed equals, yeah, therefore real speed or the actual speed equals 
the relative speed plus observer speed equals 80 plus 30 equals what? 110. Yeah, don't forget the units. Yeah, what is it? The speed is kilometer per hour. Okay, let's go. A car moves here uh, 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 like at speed 80 meter per second. If the driver uses the brakes, the speed decreases by two meter per second, each one second. Calculate the speed after 12 seconds from using the brakes. Here I have to write the given information first. The given information are that the uh, initial speed is 80 meter per second and the time is 12 seconds. But what is this? This is uh, speed decreases by two meter per second, each one second. This represents the acceleration. Here we go with acceleration. If you're going to substitute the acceleration by two, you will get uh, a false answer. Why? Because he said decreases. Therefore, you have to substitute the acceleration by a negative value, negative two. Don't forget this. Okay, therefore, to calculate the what? Yeah, the final speed. What is it? The final speed here, V2 equals V1 plus acceleration multiplied by the two. By the time here, V1 is the 80 plus negative two multiplied by the time 12. It is 80 plus negative 24 equals what? Equals 80 minus 24 equals 56, 56 foot meter per second. Okay, here we go with this uh, um, problem. In the opposite figure, an object is moving from point C to point M, passing by two points D and F in seven seconds. Calculate the covered distance and the velocity. Covered distance, covered distance, here the total distance covered is CD plus DF plus uh, FM. We have CD, seven meters. We have the FM, 14 meters. What about DF? Half a circle. So the it is half of the circumference. Half multiplied by two by R. By simplification, divided by two, one divided by two, one. So it is by R. By is 22 over seven. Multiplied by the radius, which is given here, 14. Divided by seven, one divided by seven, two. 22 by two is 44. Therefore, the distance equals uh, 7 plus 44 plus 14. You will get it 65 meters. What about the velocity? Velocity, don't forget it's simple, equals displacement over time. Equals what? Equals, yeah, displacement. It is the shortest straight line between the starting position C and M. 7 plus this distance is 14 also because it represents the radius. 7 plus 14 over the yeah, time, 7 seconds. 7 plus 14 equals 21 over 7 equals, yeah, 21 over 7 gives you 3. 3 what? Meter per second. That's it? No, in the direction of CM or eastward direction. Okay, now... Uh, with this question, which is two cars A and B moved with the same uh, 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 speed, which equals 30 km per hour, if the relative speed of the first car A, according to a moving observer, was 60 km per hour, and the relative speed of the second car, according to the same observer, was zero. Explain this. Okay, if car A is moving with 30 km per hour, and an observer ha, just saw it, and its relative speed is 60 km per hour, ask yourself, when can the relative speed is more than... Uh, or double the real speed. This happens when this uh, observer is moving in the opposite direction with the same speed. Therefore, this observer is moving with 30 km per hour. That's why also he can observe car B as zero. This happens when, yeah, this observer is moving in the same direction with the same speed. Here, it is opposite direction with the same speed, while here, same direction with the same speed. Okay, here from the following graph, determine the total distance that the object covered. The total distance is AB plus BC plus CD. It is a distance time graph. AB is, yeah, let's see it. Here, AB equals 20 meters. But what about BC? BC represents body 
at rest. Therefore, the distance here is zero, while CD is another 20 meters. Like if you're going to go from your home to school and spend four hours, for example, huh, at school, then return back to home again. Before you cover the distance of the total distance is 40 meters. Okay. Now let's study this part. Uh, it represents a movement of an object and calculate the value of acceleration. We know that acceleration equals delta V over delta T equals V2 minus V1 over the time. V2 here, it is the speed, the uh, final speed, which is 60, minus initial speed, which is zero, over the time here, which is three. It is 20, what, meter per second square, because we are calculating the acceleration. Okay, let's go. Now let's take some rest from the uh, physics and start with unit three, lesson one, uh, this lesson, the universe and the solar system. Okay, the universe. What do you know about the universe? It is the wide and extended space that ha, contains all the galaxies, stars, planets, moons, living organisms, and everything. Okay, galaxies. Galaxies are the building unit of the universe. They are groups of stars that rotate together in the cosmic space by the effect of gravity. But all galaxies look the same. They have different shapes. According to what? According to the harmony and yeah, the order of stars that make them up. Also here we have to know that galaxies clusters are, they are groups of galaxies that rotate together in the cosmic space by the effect of gravity. Now here we come with uh, to which galaxy does our solar system belong? Have you ever wondered about this? Yes, this is yeah the Milky Way galaxy. So the galaxy to which our solar system belongs is the Milky Way galaxy. Let's see it. Yeah, it is one of the spiral galaxies, but why it is named so? This is because that it appears in the sky at night as a splashing milk or spreading straw. The solar system. We all know that the solar system is composed of the sun and the eight planets revolving around the sun. Okay, let's see it. Where's our sun? Okay, the sun and the planets here are located at one of the spiral arms of the, yeah, the Milky Way galaxy. And the sun takes about 220 million years to rotate around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. What keeps the planets in their orbits around the sun and the moons in their orbits around the planets? This is for sure by the gravitational force. How can we measure the distances between celestial bodies in the universe? For sure, we're not going to use kil uh, kilometers or yeah, something meters or something like this. We have to use another unit, which is for sure the uh, light here. It is the distance covered uh, with the light in one year and it is equal to 9.46 multiplied by 10 to the power 12 kilometer. Now with the origin of the universe. Scientists came to this theory, which is the Big Bang theory, which assumed that the universe started as yeah, a small volume ball with high pressure and temperature, where a massive explosion happened to it from 15,000 million years ago, from which all the matter, time, energy and so on started okay we have to know that at the beginning the hydrogen gas which is found in 75 percent and helium 25 percent they merged together to form the ancestral galaxies then after the ancestral galaxies uh, what is formed there uh, the galaxies after 5000 million years uh, after 3000 million years but after 5000 million years we have to know that the yeah the Milky Way galaxy took its dusk shape. Okay, what after the Milky Way galaxy? What are we are interested in? Yeah, the sun and the earth and the planets. So after 10,000 million years, the sun huh, was born and the earth and planets also are there. After 12,000 million years, okay, of the Big Bang, the earliest life huh, forms on the earth. Then 15,000 million years, here we go with the origin of the universe. Now, theories about the evolution of the solar system, we have three theories. The nebular theory for Laplace and the, yeah, the crossing star theory for Chamberlain and Moulton. And finally, the, what the modern theory with Fred Hoyle. Nebular theory. 
what is the observation or the observations at for which the nebular theory is based on? Like Laplace observed some things here, like what? The rings around the planet, which is called Saturn. Okay, also he observed that there is something like clouds or something like clouds and nebula in the sky and in the space. Therefore, he assumed that the origin of the solar system is a glowing gaseous sphere that rotates around itself, which is called the nebula. Okay, what is the nebula and how it's formed? You have to know that I can use glowing gaseous sphere or flat rotating disk or even what? Yeah, gaseous rings. Don't forget to revise on this part, which states the phases of the formation of the solar system by the contraction of the nebula, the centrifugal force, and so on. But the most important part here, which is to know that I can use the word nebula or flat rotating disk or a glowing gaseous sphere or even gaseous rings. Crossing star theory, here it assumed that the origin of the solar system was a big star, which is the sun. Here we go with it. A huge crossing star approached the sun and it attracted the sun to it. And the face of the sun here, uh, this part of the sun that faces the crossing star will be yeah, attracted to it. And what happens? A huge explosion will happen here, or just an explosion will happen that will lead to the uh, escape of the sun from the attraction force of this crossing star, leaving gaseous rings. Those gaseous rings will condense, cool down, and forming the forms of planets later on. So I can say that crossing star theory assumed that the origin of the solar system is a big star, which is the sun, or a gaseous line, gaseous line. The modern theory, Fred Hoyle. Okay, he based the theory on just a famous phenomenon, which is the star explosion phenomenon. Let's see. He assumed that the origin of the solar system was a star rather than the sun. Let's see it. Here, a star was rotating near the sun because the sun here will uh, attract the star, but it will not attract it. What happened first? As we said first, it exploded. Therefore, due to what? Due to a violent nuclear reaction. This star will explode again due to violent nuclear reaction, which bumps the nucleus of the star away from the attraction force of the sun, but it left what? It left gaseous clouds. Those gaseous clouds will be attracted by the sun and uh, will condense, cool down, and forming the matter of the what? Forming the matter of planets later on. So we can say that according to modern theory, Fred Hoyle, uh, it assumed that the origin of the solar system is a star rather than the sun, or we can say a uh, gaseous cloud. Okay, let's go. The solar system is located at one of the, uh, of the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy. According to Laplace theory, the solar system was glowing gaseous sphere revolving around itself. The sphere is called nebula. Within minutes from the Big Bang, the ratio of hydrogen was, yeah, 75%. Galaxies began to form galaxies, not ancestral galaxies. Galaxies began to form after 3,000 million years. But what about the ancestral galaxies from 2,000 to 3,000 million years? The founder of nebular theory, huh? Pierre Simon Laplace or Laplace. The two gases which produces galaxies, stars, and universe over millions of years are hydrogen and helium. Write the scientific term. A flat gas is round dust that form the solar system. Just mention it now. It is a nebula. Put true or false in front of the following statements. The crossing star is the largest star that can be seen from the surface of the Earth. For sure not. The sun is the star that we can see from the surface of the Earth. Sudden violent chemical reactions occur within uh, minutes or within uh, the star, which led to its explosion? Mm, actually, no. Sudden violent nuclear reactions. The universe was formed due to the merging of particles of oxygen and nitrogen, known due to the merging of hydrogen and helium. Universe full of many galaxies which move away from each other. Yes, this is what is called continuous expansion of the universe. Extract the inappropriate word or and write what connects the rest of the words. Crossing star, nebula, Big Bang, modern theory. Obviously here, the, huh, the odd phrase here, the Big Bang. Why? Because the others are theories about the evolution of the solar system. Sun, galaxy, planets, and moons. 
Okay, for sure here it is the galaxy. Why? Because the others are explaining the solar system or they are related to the solar system. Okay, let's, let's start with unit two, lesson one, mirrors. Here we come to physics again. Physics again. How can we see objects? If you look at still water, you can see the image of the constructed buildings, or even if you looked at yourself in the mirror, you can see your face. This is because of, yeah, light reflection. Now, what is light reflection? As you can see here, when light falls on a reflecting surface, it bounces off or returns back in the same uh, transparent medium. But what if it is smooth surface or rough surface? If it is rough surface, so it will scatter. But if it is smooth surface, it will differ as we're going to see now. Now, let's see. It is the phenomenon of the light bouncing off returning in the same medium when it strikes a reflecting surface. Okay, if this is a plane mirror, this is uh, the light that falls on the plane mirror and we call it the incident light ray. It is a light ray that falls on the reflecting surface. What happens to this incident light ray? It will be reflected back and uh, bounces back or bounces off. And this is called the reflected light ray. It is a light ray that bounces or returns back from the reflecting surface. Now we have this line, which is called the normal. The normal splits the angle between the incident light ray and the reflected light ray uh, into two equal parts. The normal, it is the perpendicular line to the reflecting surface on the point of incidence. Here we come with this yeah, angle and this angle. This angle is called, what is it? It is the angle between the incident light ray and the normal. It's called the angle of incidence. And the other angle here, it's between the reflected light ray and the normal, which is called the angle of reflection. Here we come with the laws of light reflection. I have first law of light reflection, which states that the angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection. Please, if you have to write the scientific term, don't say first law. No, you have to say first law of light reflection because we have a lot of laws in physics, but you have to be precise. This is first law of light reflection. What about the second law of light reflection? It states that the incident, yeah, this is the incident light ray and the reflected light ray and the normal line to the reflecting surface at the point of incidence, all of them lie in one plane as if they are lying in yeah, a frame. This plane is perpendicular to the reflecting surface. Okay, this is an important notification here. If the incident light ray, this light ray, falls perpendicular on the plane mirror, this means that uh, it came to the normal. Therefore, there is no angle of incidence. So if the incident light ray falls perpendicular to the plane mirror, the angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection equals to zero. Now the mirrors. We have to say that mirrors are divided into two main types, which are the plane mirrors, okay, and the spherical mirrors. Plane mirrors are those mirrors that are used in our homes. And as you can see here, it is just a flat uh, a piece of glass that is painted from behind with a silver layer or silver material to give its reflecting surface. While the spherical mirrors here, we have concave mirror or convex mirror. Let's start with the properties of the images formed by the plane mirror. What if you're going to stand in front of a plane mirror? What are you going to see? Okay, let's here have the first property, which is the image is upright or erect. As you can see here, this boy is standing in front of a plane mirror. His head is up and legs is down. Also, uh, the image head is up and the legs are down. Therefore, this is what's meant upright or erect. Erect is another synonym for upright. The image is equal to the object in size. This means if this boy is 160 centimeters, therefore also the image will be 160 centimeters, not more or less. The image is laterally inverted or reverts, which means that, ha, huh, look at me here. Which hand I'm raising up? You will say this is the right hand. Actually, this is my huh, left hand in the real life. As you can see here, if this man is pointing with his right hand in the mirror, it appears that 
point or he's pointing with the left hand. This is what does mean laterally inverted. Laterally means uh, reversed or light appears as left and left appears as right. Okay, the image is virtual. Virtual means that the image cannot be received on a screen. If I have a screen here beside this man, this image, which is formed in or on the plane mirror, huh, will not be reflected to be formed on this screen. As you're seeing me now, we are in a virtual classroom. You are not with me. You are not with me in the real life. This is a virtual one. The distance between the object and the mirror equals the distance between the image and the mirror. This is one of the important properties of the images formed by the plane mirror. Like here, this yeah, red cube is at the distance one block from the plane mirror. Also, its image is away from the plane mirror by yeah, one block. And here, the straight line joining the object to its image is perpendicular to the surface of the mirror. If I have to connect the object to the image, it is a straight line perpendicular to the plane mirror. Now, the spherical mirrors. Spherical mirrors, from its name, it is just what? A, a part of a holosphere. According to the shining surface, it may be concave mirror, converging mirror, or yeah, convex mirror, diverging mirror. Concave mirror, it is the mirror whose reflecting shining surface is a part of the inner surface of the sphere, like the yeah, inner part or the side of the spoon that we're eating with. And the convex mirror, as you can see here, okay, it is the mirror whose reflecting shining surface is a part of the outer surface of the sphere. Please pay attention, if you're going to draw one of them, for example, here, the concave mirror, okay, so you have to draw this part. Just let me uh, draw it again. Okay, here we come. Again, here, if this is a concave mirror, the inner part is the reflecting surface, while this part is dull, or it is the back of this yeah, mirror. It's not used. This is not the reflecting surface. This is a reflecting surface. That's why here you have to draw these dashes from behind the mirror. Okay, now uh, uh, we have to know that huh, we have uh, the concave mirror, its center is in front of the mirror, while for the convex mirror, its center is behind the mirror. And this is the pool of the mirror, huh? the pool of the mirror. Don't say just the pool. No, no you don't have like the huh, north and south pools. It is just the pool of the mirror and the radius of the mirror curvature and the principal axis which passes by both center and the pool of the mirror. And what else? The uh, secondary axis and the focus. This is very important. Focus for the concave mirror, it is a real focus, which is the point of collection of the reflection of the uh, incident light rays. Like here, if the incident light rays are coming parallel from a far source, they are going to be reflected and collected at this real focus in front of the mirror. While for the incident light rays coming from a far source and they are parallel to the convex mirror, as you're going to see here, the uh, reflected rays will be scattered. That's why they are called diverging mirror. While the concave mirror is called converging mirror because it collects the reflected light ray. While the convex mirror diverges or disperses the reflected light rays. But as you can see here, they're not going to intersect. Uh, where is the focus? It is the point of collection of the extensions of the reflected light rays. Okay, now let's go here with the focal length. Focal length, F small. It is the distance between the focus and the pool of the mirror. As you can see here, uh, what is the relation between the focal length and the radius? Radius, as we know, it is... Uh, uh, between center and P. Like here, this distance between P and C represent the radius. Therefore, the uh, uh, radius of the mirror curvature equals half the diameter, and the focal length is half the radius. And therefore, the focal length is quarter the diameter. Rules to determine the direction of the reflected light rays incident on the concave mirror. If the incident light ray is parallel to the principal axis, Therefore, it will be reflected from the concave mirror passing through the focus. If it is passing through the focus, it is reflected back part of the principal axis. And if it is passing through the center of mirror curvature, it will return back on itself. Why? Because it falls perpendicular to the 
ها كونكيف ميرور وير ذا انجل اوف انسدنس ايكوال تو ذا انجل اوف ريفلكشن بروبرتيز وذ فورم ايمج باي ذا كونكيف ميرور هير Uh, the first case, when the incident light rays are coming parallel to each other from a far source, therefore, as we just mentioned, the reflected light rays will be collected at a point, which is the focus, and the image here is real and very tiny as a dot. Don't forget that real means, real image means what? It can be received on a screen. So if I'm going to put a screen here, it will be collected on this screen as a dot. It appears as a dot. Now, uh, here, if the object is at a distance greater than double the focal length, what is the meaning double the focal length greater than the radius? Therefore, uh, the first incident light ray, how can we draw it? First incident light ray part to the principal axis until you reach to the plane mirror, to the uh, concave mirror, then it will be reflected back passing through the focus. Then the second incident light ray passing through the focus will be reflected back part to the principal axis. The point of intersection here represents the point at which the image will be formed. Don't forget that you have to draw the image from the principal axis. And as you can see here, it is real inverted and diminished. But what if the object is at the center? Therefore, the image formed is also at the center, but uh, it is inverted at the same side and it is real inverted and equal to the object size. What if the object is at the distance? Yeah, less than the focal length. It is between the pool and the focus. Therefore, the image will be virtual. This is the only case in which the concave mirror can form a virtual image, and it is behind the mirror. Don't forget, you have to draw any virtual image and any extension as dashes, like this. Don't draw this image as a connected or ha, a straight ha, line like this. Okay, now, if the object is between the focus and the center, therefore, the image will be formed at a distance greater than double the focal length, and it is real inverted and magnified. If the object is at the focus, no image is formed. Why? Because the reflected light rays, these are the reflected light rays, and their extensions are parallel to each other. They are not going to intersect to form an image. What are the uses of the concave mirror in light torch, in the front uh, uh, light of the car? and in marine houses and in aircrafts, also in solar ovens to heat uh, food and so on, here to reflect the light, and sometimes at dentists also to form a magnified image for the teeth at the back and in shaving and in some telescopes. These two here, just the case of the virtual image. So when I ask you, how can you get or obtain a virtual image for you, not just a virtual, an erect, an erect magnified image for your face by concave mirror. Think about this case in which you are between the pool and the focus or at a distance less than the focal length. Okay, let's talk now about the convex mirror. Uh, um, here, the only case in which the object is at any distance from the convex mirror, the image will be virtual, yeah, erect and diminished. It is the opposite of this one. Here it was virtual, erect, and magnified. Let's see it this is just for illustration. This is the virtual image. It is uh, behind the mirror also. Don't forget, it is virtual and the extensions are virtual too. What are the uses of the convex mirror from the most important use um, for the convex mirror uh, is the side, left and si uh, right side of the uh, car mirrors. Why? To form and erect minimized image for the road behind them. And also in uh, shopping centers and in narrow roads, in parking and yeah, in meters. In it to lesson to the lenses. Here we come with this lesson, which is the lens. It is a transparent medium that refracts light and it is limited with two spherical surfaces. Pay attention, the lens is just a transparent medium. Like what? Let's see. The medical eyeglasses, the, yeah, uh, it is used in cameras also. It is used in binoculars also. In what? Yeah, the uh, hand lens, yeah, and the magnifying lens. Okay, now let's go with the telescopes and also the, yeah, microscopes. Now, types of lenses. The convex lens, which is, and you can see here, it is a converging lens. How it looks like this, it is 
thick from the middle and with less thickness from the tips. While the concave lens or the diverging lens, it is thin from the middle, while uh, it is with more thickness at the tips. Let's see here why this is called uh, converging and why this is called diverging. Let's see this now. Okay, pay attention. Convex lens collecting the refracted light rays, while the concave lens, uh, the concave lens diverts the refracted light rays. Again, what is the meaning of refraction? Refraction here means that the light will pass and it changes its direction because it passes through two transparent medium. Two transparent mediums here. Okay, now some concept related to it, the centers of the curvature of the lens face. The center of curvature of the lens face, it is the center of the sphere where this face is a part of it. And I have two center of curvatures. While in the mirrors, I have only one center of curvature. Why here I have two center of curvatures? Because I have two spherical surfaces. Here we come with the optical huh, center. Optical center here, it looks like the pool, but it's not the pool. It is a point inside the lens at the mid distance between the two surfaces of the lens. Okay, here we come with the radius and the principal axis, which passes through the two center of curvatures and the optical center. Okay, it connects the two center of curvatures and passing by the, the optical center. These are the secondary axes of the yeah, lens. Here we come to the focus. The focus for the convex lens is a real focus and it is a point of collection of the refracted light rays and uh, it is a real focus. Pay attention, it is formed on the other side of the incident light rays, while the virtual focus of the concave lens, it is uh, where it is at the same side of the incident uh, light rays. We can say that it is a point of collection of the extensions of the refracted light rays, because these are the refracted light rays. They are scattered. If we're going to draw extensions, here we come to the focus of the concave lens. Now, the focal lens, as we mentioned before. Now, we want to determine the direction of the light rays after passing uh, through the convex lens. Okay, the incident light ray part of the principal axis will uh, refract passing through the focus from the other side, while the one passing through the focus will uh, refract passing part to the principal axis from the other side. And finally, the incident light ray that passes through the optical center will pass without refraction. Okay, now the properties of the formed image by the convex lens. I have six cases. They are the same as the mirrors. Just to show you here, these are the same conditions. But don't forget, the real images here are formed on the other side of the uh, object. Let's see it. If the, this is if the object is at the center, the image will also be at the center, but from the other side, it's real, inverted, and equal. Okay, and this is the same here as the mirror, the same conditions, but don't forget also here, if the object is at the focus, no image is formed due to what? Then the refracted light rays and their extensions are parallel to each other, they not intersect to form an image. Finally, what? Yeah, this is if the object is between the optical center and the focus, or at a distance less than the focal lens. A virtual image will be formed. Where is it? at the same side of the object, uh, farther than the object relative to the lens. Don't forget, virtual image, just like dots, and their extensions, the extensions of the refracted light rays. Now, the properties of the formed image by the concave lens, here I have only one, yeah, one condition, at which if the object is at any distance from the uh, uh, concave lens, a virtual, erect, and minimized image is formed. Where is it? on the same side of the object, nearer to the lens uh, than the object. Why here I have eyes? Just when you uh, read, eye sees, eye sees means what? That the eyes only can see uh, this image. So the image is virtual. The image cannot be received on a screen. If I said that the image can be received on a screen, this means that this is a real image. But if the image cannot be received on a screen, I can use the uh, eye sees. 
Okay, the vision. What is vision? Okay, here, how can normal people see objects? Uh, here we go with the, yes, the cornea, and behind the cornea we have the lens, and the eye lens is a kind of convex lens. The distance between the lens and the retina, here I have a retina here, this is the point at which the image is formed. We can consider the retina as the screen for the image to be formed on. And by the way, the image is formed here on the retina, inverted. How can we see objects quite like as they are normal and they are corrected? It's corrected by the optical nerve that will carry this image to the brain and it will recorrect it to its normal size and uh, 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 just the same shape and so on. Now let's talk about the most important vision. The effects are the short-sightedness and long-sightedness. But before this, you have to know that normal people can see objects uh, 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 not less than 25 centimeters and not more than uh, six meters. What is the short-sightedness? Okay, it is a vision defect through which near objects only can be seen clearly, but far objects seem distorted. As you can see here, okay guys, be just here, Outside the glasses, the far objects seem distorted. Okay, what about the long-sidedness? From its name, it is a vision defect through which the, yeah, the far objects can only be seen clearly, but near objects seem distorted. So we can just uh, understand this from seeing outside the glasses, he cannot read the book which is near to him. Okay, what are the reasons for short-sidedness? The reasons for short-sidedness to increase increase in the eyeball diameter and increase in the convexity of the eye lens. Increase in the eyeball diameter. For example, if this eyeball diameter is increased like this, okay, this is an increased eyeball diameter. This is the lens, for example. Therefore, huh, this causes the retina to be far away from the eye lens. Therefore, the, yeah, the image will be formed in front of the retina or between the lens and the retina. But what if the, uh, uh, there is an increase in the convexity of the eye lens? What is the meaning of convexity of the eye lens? We all know that the eye lens is a convex lens. This is the normal size of the lens, for example. If there is an increase in the convexity, increase in the convexity means increase in its curvature, like this, okay? Therefore, uh, it has a shorter focal length, or the focus is near to the lens. That's why we have what? This causes a shorter focal lens for the eye lens. While for the long-sidedness, it is decrease and decrease. Decrease in the eyeball diameter. So instead of the normal size of the eyeball, I have a decreased eyeball diameter or shortness in the radius or the diameter of the eyeball. Don't be confused. When I say shortness in the eyeball diameter, I don't mean short-sidedness, but I mean shortness here, decrease. This causes that the retina to be, yes, near to the eye lens. And also decrease in the convexity of the eye lens surface, which causes that uh, a longer focal length. Okay, now this leads to, as we just mentioned, that the light rays coming from far objects are collected at the point in front of the eye retina and disperses after that forming a, an unclear image. While here, the light rays coming from the near objects, okay, are collected at the point uh, behind the eye retina and disperses after the forming an uh, unclear image. How can we correct short-sidedness and long-sidedness? Short-sidedness is corrected by using what? A concave lens. Why a concave lens? Because it diverges the rays coming uh, from the far source, okay? Uh, uh, before falling on the eye, so the image of the object is formed exactly on the retina, while the long sidedness is corrected by using a convex lens. Why convex lens? Because it collects the rays before falling on the eye, so the image of the object is formed exactly on the retina. Now with some questions. Choose the correct answer. If the angle between the reflecting surface of the plane mirror and the reflected light ray is 140 degrees, so the angle of incidence equal to, uh, I have to draw it. Now here, if I have, this is the plane mirror. This is the reflected light ray. 140 degrees for sure, this is not the angle I'm talking about because this is an obvious angle. Therefore, I'm talking about this part. 
This is 140 degrees. I have two ways. The first one is to draw the normal. I know that uh, this is, yeah, this is 90. 140, this whole angle minus the 90 gives you what? Yeah, 50 degrees. This is the angle of reflection. Therefore, the angle of incident is 50 degrees. The other way is, I know that the straight angle here, 180 minus 140, therefore, this is equal to 40 degrees. And this is 90. 90 minus 40 gives you the 50 also. Okay, now, if the distance between the two center of curvatures of the lens is 20 centimeters, this means that the focal lens is okay. Let's here talk about this. Here I have center and the optical center and the center. This distance represents the radius, and this distance also represents another radius. The distance between C and C represents the R plus R, the diameter. Therefore, if the diameter is 20 centimeters, the focal length will be quarter this diameter, which will be 5 centimeters. The body between the focus and the center of curvature of the concave mirror, its image is, if the body is between the focus and the center, therefore, the image will be what? Real and magnified. Uh, if what is placed to the right and left of the car's driver, for sure, this is the convex mirror. A light ray falls on a plane mirror as in the opposite figure. The sum of the angle of incident and angle of reflection. First, we have to calculate the angle of incidence. Here it is 90 minus the 30. 90 minus the 30 gives you 60 degrees. If this is the answer, no, this is not the answer. The sum of the angle of incident and angle of reflection like this, here 60 plus 60 gives you the 120 degrees. The image properties formed by the plane mirror is upright, real, all the previous answers. The plane mirror always give yeah, erect and virtual images, not real. So it is upright. The opposite figure represents one of the vision defects. This person suffers from a vision defect, which is called, hmm, what is this? Is it short sightedness or long sightedness? And why? If the image is formed in front of the retina, so this is short-sidedness. And the vision defect is treated with concave lens. Okay. Now look at the following figures, then mention radius of curvature and focal length. Here I have a point in front of the concave mirror, and the distance between this point and the mirror is 12 centimeters. And I have an important, yeah, uh, just part here, which is that the incident light ray falls and returns back on itself. Therefore, this is the center of mirror curvature. And this distance is the radius. So the radius is 12 centimeters and the focal length is half the radius, which will be six centimeters. Now, in the opposite figure, an object was put on 12 centimeter distance from a convex lens. A real inverted and equal to the object image was formed. Ha, top, let's see. I have to draw it first and know the information given, which is that the distance between this object and the lens, 12 centimeters, inverted an equal image. This happens only when the object is at the center. Therefore, the image will be formed also at the center from the other side, and it is equal in size. Just, uh, we have to interpret the given information. This distance is 12 centimeters. Okay, now if this distance is 12 centimeters and this whole distance is 20 centimeters, therefore this distance is 8 centimeters. Don't forget that the image by the lens will be drawn here. Okay, the object image was formed, then this image falls on a plane mirror away from the lens by 20 centimeters. What is the distance between the object and the formed image by the plane mirror? This image formed by the lens is considered as an object to the plane mirror. The plane mirror will form another image for this uh, image formed by the lens. Therefore, it will be there behind the mirror at a distance equals to eight centimeters. Why? Because the distance between the object and the mirror is the same distance between the image and the mirror. Now, the distance between the object and the image formed by the 
Yeah, the plane mirror is 12 plus 20 plus 8. 12 plus 20 plus 8 gives you the 40 centimeters. If the image formed by the plane mirror upright or inverted for the original re, uh, object, it is inverted for the original one. From the opposite figure, in which position from one to four suitable to form or to put the uh, uh, object to form? Real, inverted, and diminished image. Real, inverted, and diminished means that the object is at a distance greater than double the focal length, which is at position three. Virtual, upright, and enlarged. To get a, a like an upright and virtual enlarged image, so by the convex lens, so the object should be at a distance less than the focal length, which is position one. No image is formed if the object is at the focus, position two. And right, here you have to draw direction for this uh, uh, one. In the opposite figure, an object is placed in front of a convex lens and put on the other side a plane mirror. When we look in the mirror, we find that no image is formed for the object. Mention the position of the object from the lens. Okay, why no image is formed? Actually, here, you have to think about this. If I have the object in front of the lens, when can no image is formed? No image is formed when this object is at the focus. Why? Because if it is at the focus, the refracted light rays and their extensions will not uh, meet or intersect to form an image. Okay, let's go with yeah, this one here. The figure represents two similar lenses A and B, have a common principal axis and the principal focus of them at point F. This is the principal focus. Okay, in the middle. This means that this F, this focus is for A and B. At the middle uh, uh, distance between them, an incident light ray falls on lens A parallel to its principal axis. Copy the figure in your answer sheet, then uh, follow the trace and trace it. Okay, let's go with, yeah. Here, this is the incident light ray parallel to the principal axis. It will be refracted, okay, passing through the focus like this. And until it reaches here, this incident light ray to lens B is passing through the focus, so it will be refracted parallel to the principal axis. Okay, the other question, to make the light ray that passes through the lens B returns to its source, we have to put what on uh, X? Is it a concave or a plane or a convex mirror? If you put a concave mirror, for example, okay, so I'm going to put a concave mirror here, and the incident light ray will fall on it. I don't know that if this incident light ray, it's parallel, so it should be passing through the focus. But what if I put, okay, instead of this convex or concave mirror, I will put what a plain mirror. A plain mirror here will be like this. Okay, now this plain mirror, I'm sure this is the back of the mirror, the incident light ray falls perpendicular to the plane mirror. Therefore, it reflected, it is reflected uh, back on itself. Okay? Therefore, uh, this is an incident light ray now relative to the uh, uh, lens B. It will be refracted passing through the focus. And then for lens A, uh, this light ray passing through the focus will be refracted uh, parallel to the principal axis. So the answer here we have to put, yeah, what? A plane mirror at point X. Ronaldo stands in front of a plane mirror at a distance five meter and images form to him behind the mirror. If the mirror moved towards him four meter, the distance between his first and second image is, okay, let's talk about this. I have to draw. If you're not going to draw, you will ha, not answer these kinds of questions. So now this is the mirror, for example. Okay. This is Ronaldo. He's away from the mirror by ha, five meters. For sure, this mirror will form another, ha, this will form image for Ronaldo behind the mirror at a distance 
five meters also because the distance between the object and the mirror is the same distance between the image and the mirror. Let's name them. This is image one and this is mirror one. Why mirror one? Because this is the position of the mirror. If the mirror moved four meters towards the uh, towards Ronaldo, let's use another color and this will be the new position of the mirror. Okay. Now, here we come that it moved four meters. This distance is four meters. Okay, now what is this distance between Ronaldo and the new position of the mirror? Five minus four equals one meter. This new position of the mirror will form a, another image for Ronaldo, which will be here, for example, it is away from the mirror by one meter. What is this distance? If this is four, from here to there is four, and this is one, therefore this is, uh, what is this? Yeah, this is four. Actually, you have to know that the distance between uh, Ronaldo, the, this, uh, this is Ronaldo, again, one meter to the plane mirror, and this is one meter. It moved four meters. This is four meters. Okay, therefore, this distance here, four minus one gives you three meters. Now, what is the distance between his first and second image? Let's see this. His first image is there. And second image is here. This is five meters plus the three meters give you eight meters. Okay, let's go now with the, yeah, the last uh, uh, unit four here, lesson one, cell division. Cell division, we all know that any living organism is composed of cells, and it is the building unit of a, any living organism. But some living organisms are unicellular living organism in which the entire body or the whole organism is made up of one cell. Therefore, here the, uh, I have unicellular organisms or multicellular organisms. The unicellular organisms are like the bacteria, the paramecium, the amoeba, while the multicellular organisms are like plants, animals, humans, and so on, and insects. Let's go with types of cells. For the multicellular living organisms, for sure, they don't have uh, the same kinds of cells, although they, they have maybe the same function or near the same function, but not all cells are the same. While the function of the neural cells differ from the function of the muscle cells, for example, also their shape differs. Therefore, also I have two types of cells, the somatic cells and the reproductive cells. All of your body is made up of somatic cells, except uh, some parts which are made of reproductive cells. So somatic cells are all body cells except the reproductive cells. Like what? Like the uh, cells of skin, the liver, the, the liver cells, the kidney cells, and so on. In humans and animals, and for plants, it is the leaves, stems, and roots. While the reproductive cells, they are, like what? They are uh, testes and over cells in humans and animals and anthers and over cells in flowering plants. Okay, this is the, as you can see here, the anther, which is the male reproductive cell of the plant, and the ovary, which is the female reproductive cell of the plant. Okay, let's talk about the uh, cell structure first. The structure of the cell that I have, plant cell and animal cell. Let's talk about the animal cell, for example. The animal cell has many components, many organelles. From the components, we have the nucleus. In the nucleus, we have a uh, like thread-like bodies that are called what chromosomes that contain the genetic materials transmitted from parents to daughter cells. They have the main role in cell division. That's why you look like your parents because you inherited something from your parents. You took something from them, carried by the chromosomes in your nucleus. Okay, so this is the nucleus. Inside them, I have the thread-like bodies, which are the chromosomes. Here again, the nucleus, and inside them there, yeah, the thread-like bodies chromosomes. Let's talk about the structure of chromosomes. I have general structure of chromosome or the chemical structure of chromosome. 
the general structure of chromosome, it is like what? Two connected threads. Each one is the chromatid, and they are connected together by the centromere. Each chromosome consists of two connected threads, rods. Each thread is called chromatid, and the two chromatids are connected together by the point which is called centromere. While the chemical structure of chromosome, I have two things, nucleic acid DNA and protein. Here, as we can see, DNA is the double-stranded DNA. Okay, here, like this. Okay, the double-stranded. Okay. The double-stranded DNA, okay, you can draw it like this, will be coiled, coiled around what? Coiled around some proteins. And then it will be super coiled, super coiled again, what? To make the chromosomes. Okay, let's go. Each chromatid consists of a nucleic acid DNA, which carries the genes that carry the genetic or hereditary traits material of the living organisms and the proteins. Okay, now number of chromosomes. Are number of chromosomes uh, important? Yes, sure. As you can see here, for human uh, beings, I have 46 chromosomes in each cell. I have 46 chromosomes in my cell. And you have also 46 chromosomes in your cell, which differs from the number of chromosomes in dogs, for example, or chimpanzee, or uh, the rice or round worm. Therefore, the number of chromosomes are different, okay, among the members of the same species or from species to another. Yes, among the members of the same species, the chromosomes number are fixed, but uh, in different species, they are different. Okay, so the somatic cells and reproductive cells, while the gametes, male gametes, sperms, and female gametes, over. Okay, what are the number of chromosomes in somatic cells and reproductive cells? Each one of them contains a complete number of chromosomes, complete two sets of chromosomes, one from male gamete and the other from female gamete. What is the meaning of this? This is what is called human karyotype. How many chromosomes we just mentioned? 46 chromosomes. Why are they arranged like this? These are homologous chromosomes. What is the meaning of homologous chromosomes? Homologous chromosomes means that they are with the same size and carrying with the same arrangement of genes. For example, if this gene here represents or it controls the eye color, this gene also for the homologous pair is composed of this gene controlling also the eye color but maybe they come with different forms. Like this one is with blue eye color and this one is with brown eye color. Okay, so you inherit half of your chromosomes from your father and the other half from your mother. Each one of them contains a complete number of chromosomes, complete two sets of chromosomes, one from male gamete and the other from female gamete. The number of chromosomes in somatic cells and reproductive cells are diploid number 2N. While the gametes, what are gametes? We just mentioned, ha, huh? gametes, ha, huh? like sperms formed by males in animals and humans, or the ova formed by females in animals and humans. But what about the plants? You know, those dust-like particles, yellow dust-like particles that we call them the pollen grains, these are the male gametes for the plants, and the female gametes are the ha, huh, ova or eggs found in the ovaries. Each one of them contains half the number of chromosomes are present in the reproductive cell or in somatic cells. The number of chromosomes is a uh, haploid number N. Okay, let's go. Importance of chromosomes. They represent the genetic material of the living organism. They have the main role in cell division. Knowing the number of chromosomes helps in identifying the animal and plant species. What are the types of cell division? I have two types mitotic cell division and meiotic cell division. Mitotic cell division takes place in somatic cells except the neural and adult red blood cells. Why neural red cells ha, don't have or they don't undergo mitosis? Because they lack centrosomes, while adult, adult red blood cells, because they have no nucleus. At which the cell divides into two new cells. Somatic cells also, like the uh, skin cells, will undergo mitosis to give another skin cells. Each of them contains the same number of chromosomes, diploid number. So I start up with 2N, I end up with two cells, two daughter cells, which are 2N also. 
while the mitotic, meiotic cell division, here the meiosis, it occurs in the reproductive cells. Why? To get the gametes, which are haploid. I have four new cells formed by the meiosis, four gametes, which are haploid. Now let's go here. Don't be confused that this is called a chromosome and this is also called a chromosome, but they are doubled. Yes, it's doubled during the inner phase. And we are counting the number of chromosomes according to the number of centromeres. This is a chromosome with one chromatid. This is also one chromosome, but with two chromatids. Okay, so here the inner phase, it is the phase that happens or takes place before the mitotic cell division or the meiotic cell division, where the, uh, uh, it prepares the cell for division by the occurrence of some important biological processes and the uh, what? Yes, for sure, the duplication of the genetic material, DNA, uh, here takes place. Uh, this is how it looks like. The, uh, 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 the chromosomes look like chromatin reticulum, and this is the nucleolus, nuclear membrane, and these are the centrosomes that will form later, or the spindle fibers will come from them later on. Now, the mitotic cell division or mitosis, I start with a parent cell or a parent somatic cell, which is deployed. I end up with two Hmm. daughter cells to uh, somatic daughter cells, which are deployed also. Here, the prophase, don't forget P, mat, P, mat, P for prophase, M, metaphase, A for anaphase, T for telophase. Prophase, here, we have to revise on this part. As you can see here, the, the nucleolus, nuclear membrane will disappear. The, what? The chromatin reticulum will intensify and condense to form the long, thin, double, uh, strings, chromosomes, and the spindle fibers will be formed at the poles of the, yeah, the cell. They are connected to the, what, the, yeah, chromosomes from the centromere. The metaphase. Metaphase, I'll give you this tip. Metaphase starts with M and middle starts with M. So the chromosomes align in the middle of the cell or at the cell equator. And they are connected to the, what, spindle fibers from both sides. Then anaphase, anaphase away or apart, the spindle fibers will shrink and the centromeres will split lengthwise. And the spindle fibers will pull the two chromatids of the chromosome apart. We started here with four chromosomes, while here I have at each pool, I have four chromosomes. Each one has one chromatid. And finally, the telophase. Telophase, after which uh, the cell divides into two identical daughter cells, each one is deployed. The telophase is the adverse changes of the prophase. What happens here uh, and what disappeared here will reappear here again. The nuclear membrane will reappear, the nucleolus will return back, and the what else? The spindle fibers will disappear. The splitting for it will happen to form two identical yeah, cells. Now with the meiosis. This is the overview for the meiosis. The parent cell, first meiotic division and second meiotic division. The first meiotic division will form two haploid cells. Then each haploid cell will undergo another second meiotic division, which will form uh, another two haploid cells. Therefore, after the first and second meiotic division, or at the end of meiosis, I will get four haploid cells or four gametes. What is the difference between the haploid cell here and this one? Here, the haploid cells are uh, double-stranded, or each chromosome has two chromatids, while here, each chromosome has one strand only. Let's see what happens in prophase one. Pay attention here because this is very important and has a, an important phenomenon. The chromosomes here will be arranged as chromosome pairs. Do you think they remember the homologous pair of chromosomes? This is a homologous pair of chromosome. While here they are going to be arranged as homologous pair in the form of tetrad. Tetra means four. Therefore here a tetrad is the arrangement of homologous pair where it consists of two chromosomes and four chromatids like this, four chromatids. And the nuclear membrane will disappear, nucleus will disappear and so on. But at the end of this phase, a crossing over phenomenon takes place where the inner parts of the chromatids of the tetrad will exchange randomly, which contributes in genetic variation. After this, the metaphase one. 
Metaphase one, which differs from metaphase of mitosis here, the homologous pair of chromosomes have a line at the cell equator. While in anaphase, pay attention, no splitting for the centromere will take place. Only the uh, spindle fibers will shrink, pulling the homologous pair of chromosomes apart. Here they pull the chromatids apart. Here they pull the homologous pair apart. Therefore, at the uh, two poles of the cell, as you can see here, I started with four chromosomes. At each pole of the cell, I have only two chromosomes. Therefore, here uh, we started to get the haploid cell. At the end of telophase one, I will have two cells which are haploid, but the uh, chromosomes here are with double stranded or like the uh, double strings. They have, each chromosome has its sister chromatid. Okay, you have to know that uh, by the end of meiosis two, meiosis two just resembles the mitotic division. Now, here we come with unit four, lesson two, sexual and asexual reproduction, reproduction process. What is reproduction? It is a biological process. Okay, we have to know that it is one of the most important processes by which an organism produces new individuals of the same kind. Why? To ensure continuity. Without reproduction, the, uh, the life will come to an end. I have uh, asexual reproduction, which we have to know that it uh, uh, depends on one individual or one parent only. Asexual reproduction occurs in unicellular living organisms and some multicellular animals and plants where a living organism produces new individuals that have genetic traits identical to the parents. Here, some important properties of asexual reproduction. It takes place by only one living organism. One parent only is needed. So how can we get new offsprings? By, yeah, by mitosis. If you remember from the importance of mitosis that, yeah, to compensate the missing or the damaged cells for growth and completing the asexual reproduction. Now, here we come to, it doesn't require special systems or structures in living organisms like the ovary, for example, for the plant. I don't need any special uh, uh, systems or organs here. It takes place by mitotic division and it keeps the genetic structure of the living organism. Why? Because it produces new individuals identical in genetic structure to the original living organism during mitotic division. While the sexual reproduction, we have to talk about that it's a biological process that occurs between two parental individuals of the same kind, male and female, to produce new individuals have new genetic traits that combine the parents' genetic traits. Therefore, the properties of the sexual reproduction, that sexual reproduction occurs between two parental individuals, one of them is a male and the other is female. Here we need a special reproductive organs and systems like the anther and the ovary and the testes and the ovary too. It takes place by meiotic division, and it doesn't keep the genetic structure of the living organism. Sexual reproduction is a source of genetic variation. Why? This is because that crossing over happens in the meiosis division, and also the offspring resulted from the sexual reproduction gets his genetic trait from two sources. The resulted offspring has new genetic traits that combine the parents' traits. Types of sexual asexual reproduction. Here we come with the binary fission and the budding. There, for the regeneration and the sporogeny or spore propagation, and the, finally, the vegetative reproduction. Binary fusion, it is the simplest form of the asexual reproduction, in which the, yeah, the parental individual will disappear. It takes place in unicellular protozoans like amoeba, okay, paramecium, like this one, and euglena, and simple algae and bacteria. Okay, what uh, about budding? takes place in unicellular organisms such as yeast fungus, multicellular organisms like hydra and sponges. Okay, don't forget that if the, uh, uh, this bud will be formed, be attached to the body of the parent, huh, it will form a colony. Don't forget this term. Regeneration, it takes place where huh, it occurs in multicellular uh, uh, living organisms, okay, such as starfish. Okay, don't forget that uh, if part of the central desk will be there with the missing part, like this finger is with missing part, okay? So this part of the, uh, the starfish will form a whole new individual by undergoing mitosis. And the last part of this, of the remaining part of the starfish will undergo mitosis also to compensate its missing part by regeneration. Spore propagation or sporogeny, it takes place where 
for some fungi such as bread, mold, and mushrooms, and some algae. Here I have a special organ, which is called the sporangium, okay, at which it composed of some spores inside. Those spores, when they come to be mature, they, the sporangium will, uh, the sac will, what, rapture to release large amount of the spores and then when they find a suitable environment a wet bread also they will form another new fungus that will grow again vegetative reproduction okay so like this potato these buds okay because in plants vegetative organs like stems roots leaves without the need of seeds why without the need of seeds because seeds here are formed due to the fertilization or the combination between the pollen grain and the ova okay Therefore, it forms the seeds. Seeds huh, is one of the ways to get plants different from the parent plants. Okay, artificially, it is called tissue culture. Artificially, it is called tissue culture. Now, some uh, um, questions. It's possible to produce new plants identical to the mother plant by identical, so it is vegetative reproduction or tissue culture. The crossing over phenomenon takes place at the end of the first, at the end of the first, yes, prophase, prophase one of meiosis. Starfish reproduces asexually by, yeah, regeneration. If each cell of the fruit fly wing contains eight chromosomes, then the number of chromosomes of the ovary cell is equal to, okay, the fly wing is one of the somatic cells. So this number represents the complete two sets of chromosomes or deployed number eight is 2n. Ovary. Ovary is, yeah, is it uh, a somatic or reproductive or a gamete? Ovary is a reproductive cell. It is also 2N, therefore it consists of eight chromosomes or it can be four pairs. In meiosis division, the chromosomes are doubled in the interface. Okay, in meiosis division, the chromosomes are doubled just once before meiosis one. Okay, pay attention to this. The cell resulting from fertilization process is called zygote. Okay, now let's go. Choose the correct answer. A starfish reproduces asexually by, yeah, we said this before, regeneration. A tetrad consists of, tetrad means uh, two chromosomes, four chromatids, two centromeres. So it is four chromatids, two centromeres. The phase in which the cell prepares itself for mitotic division to duplicate the genetic material is inner phase. What reproduction is a source of genetic variation? For sure, it is sexual reproduction. The following figure is for one of the phases of cell division. Answer the following questions. The name of the phase is, for sure, this is anaphase two. And the number of chromosomes at the end of cell division in each cell pool in the number of chromosome in the parent cell uh, is half, because this is meiosis. Choose the odd word or phrase. Amoeba, paramecium, sponge, euglena. Okay, mm, think about it. For sure, this is the sponge. Why? The others are related because they are reproducing by binder fission. Production of sperms, compensation of the damaged cells, production of cells identical to the parent cell, growth of living organisms. For sure, the odd phrase here will be production of sperms. Why? Because the others uh, are from the importance of mitotic cell division. Crossing over phenomenon. Chromatin reticulum condenses on double strings chromosomes. Nucleolus disappear. The centromere of each chromosome splits lengthwise in two halves. Spindle fibers are formed. Okay, for sure. This one, the centromere of each chromosome splits lengthwise in two halves. Because this takes place in anaphase, while the others uh, take place in uh, prophase. Cells of skin, cells of liver, cells of kidney, cells of ovum. Hmm. Think about it. Cells of ovum. Why? Because here, uh, this is uh, cells of ovum. You can say that all of them here are diploid, and this is uh, haploid, or also this is a gamete, and those are, yep, skin, liver cell, and kidney somatic cells. Fertilized egg, gamete, zygote, liver cell, for sure the gamete. Why? Because the gamete is haploid, while the others are uh, diploid. Amoeba, paramecium, mushroom, and euglena. For sure, it is mushroom. Why? Amoeba, paramecium, and euglena are reproducing by binary fission. Believe in yourself. You are unique. You are smart and talented. Just uh, study hard, and you can do it. 
see you later inshallah